All right, guys, so um, I'll compensate for last time by basically not even touching the board probably today, if I can, uh, because I just want to go over uh, a little more over uh, the Gauss variational equations, uh, but uh, you know, many of the steps for J2 in particular are here in the book, and there's really no value for us to go through them in details. I'll just project the pages and explain what's going on, which is pretty much what we've done last time. Uh, so this will be um, J2, so forget about this matrix here. Uh, if I want uh, the perturbation due to the uh, oblateness at the poles, this is what you have in your software, right? These 3 over 2, J2, et cetera, et cetera. And these three, you, you have it in the code. And uh, one, one of the lectures, we, uh, we spent it proving this first piece, right? The component on the x direction due to the uh, gravitational potential that is including J2. Uh, and so, now, as we know, the gas variational equations take the uh, projection of perturbations in uh, the radial, uh, normal to the orbit, and tangential direction. So what you would have to do if you want to use them uh, for J2 is take something that you know in ECI, this vector. So forget about this constant. This is, you can, it's not really a constant. The radius is changing, but uh, basically, it's not, you can collect it outside. But this would be the vector uh, in ECI that you want to project in LVLH, right? So that you can get PS due to J2, PR, and PW that go into those gas variational equations. Uh, let me just project them just to refresh uh, what is the general expression we have. Except the ADT, which is not here, but I gave it to you last time. Uh, the gas variational equations are first order differential equations in the six orbital parameters where the perturbation acceleration comes in as, again, PR, PS, PW, R, S, and W are the three directions of LVLH. And so anytime you have a different perturbation, you have to figure out how you project it into that uh, basis. Now, this matrix here, where U is, uh, well, I'm going to touch the board. U is uh, the true anomaly plus the argument of perigee. This is called uh, argument of latitude, it's just the addition of those two angles. That matrix there, it's the matrix due to a 3, 1, 3 rotation that goes from ECI to the perifocal frame. Uh, actually, no, this is the whole thing. This goes to the perifocal frame and then it adds an additional rotation of theta to go to LVLH. Just to refresh with an image what we're talking about, I think the book has a much better image than what I can create on the board somewhere. Of course, I think I passed it. Uh, maybe not. Have you, have you looked at this? I scanned this stuff. Um, OK, at the beginning of perturbations, they do introduce the basis that we use. And so I just want to find that nice image where they, they have the three of them at the same time. Oh, come on. I know you're there. OK, cannot find it. You know which one I'm talking about? Fit page. Here it is. Huh. It was right there. Oh, no. OK, so this is the one. So the IJK is ECI. The blue line is the orbit. Uh, the P direction is the direction of eccentricity. Again, if you don't have an eccentricity, just call that your initial radius. You have to decide some direction in space from which you measure theta. Uh, the Q, in, no, I'm sorry, the W is the normal to the orbit. The Q uh, completes a right-handed coordinate system, and that's my perifocal basis. Then uh, if I want to go from that basis to the LVLH, which is this other one here with the satellite, R, W, and S, I only have an additional rotation about the angular momentum vector. Do we see that? OK, so in other words, if I have a vector that is expressed in, a, in i, j, and k, in that basis, if I want to go to perifocal, you take the 3, 1, 3 rotation with the inclination. Well, first it's argu argument of, uh, I'm sorry, right ascension of the ascending node, inclination, argument of perigee. And then you have a little more with theta, right? The difference between the perifocal basis and LVLH is only that they are rotated by an angle theta about the w axis. Do we see that? 
if I'm looking from above at the orbit from the H uh, point of view, W is sticking out, right? And so say that this is the direction of the eccentricity vector, this gives me the P vector. Uh, and then I have Q this way, right? Well, LVLH has the same W, uh, the difference is that if this is my orbit, uh, at a generic time, I may be somewhere like here, this is my angle theta. So I, I basically see here the same basis, except that those two vectors, P and Q, are now called R and S, and they are rotated by an angle theta. Do we see that? And so, if I go back to that huge matrix, which is down here somewhere, a few pages down, oops, no, not yet, here it is. That matrix there, it's, uh, it's again, bringing that vector that it's in ECI into LVLH, that's what it does. All the angles are there, again, U is containing theta and omega, little omega, big omega is there, inclination is there, everything is there. Then from that point on, you do, a, you do use spherical trigonometry, how many have done spherical trigonometry in any of the classes here? Never seen it before? You, you may have seen it in some classes, but again, I'm not going to go through the steps. The bottom line is that you, you use this projection, do your transform x, y, z into uh, spherical coordinates, and in the end, this is what you get. These box expressions are how the perturbation due to J2 will project in the radial direction, uh, tangential direction, and, uh, and this is a W, of course, it's a typo in the book, at least the version of the book I have, this cannot be another S. It's a W one. So fix that in your, uh, in your PDF, I forgot to fix it. Um, but make a comment that that's the last one, it's obviously PW. Okay. And uh, well, what you do is you go to the classical generic expression of the Gauss variational equations and you get these equations. They're ugly, they're always ugly. There's a lot of transformations and angles involved. Uh, and do I get any insight from this? Not really. Um, I can integrate them, by the way, I'm gonna spend the rest of the class at some point showing you how you integrate them numerically, because there was a question about that, and it's, it's, it's not that difficult, but it does require some attention. Um, but this is what you get. So if you want to integrate this numerically, you can. These are going to give you how at each instant in time, each of these osculating orbital element is changing due to the fact that the planet is an ellipsoid. I squeeze at the poles again. That's all I'm taking into account. The equator is still a circle, uh, which is not true, but this is my model. Now these are, uh, they are useful for numerical integration, you can, you can integrate them, you can see the evolution of the orbital parameters, but uh, much more useful is averaging these out, uh, which is also a procedure that I'm not going to go step by step, because it does require a lot of work, but we do need to know that people take, when possible, these equations and basically try to remove everything that is an oscillation here. And the main one, it's that cosine or sine of theta. It's you going around an orbit, right? So what people do is take these equations and uh, average them over an orbit and see what happens. So there is a problem here, let's see. Yeah, no, I don't wanna see this. Okay. Again, it's, in, it's an integral on the orbit um, that you do and you remove, you remove that, os that oscillation. So if you do follow that procedure, you do get much nicer equations for J2. This is what the book gives you, the drag we have seen it last time, we'll comment on that again. Uh, but so, you need to know, the Gauss variational equations, the general form, we have proven one of them. You need to know how the drag goes into them because we have seen it. You need to know the expression for J2, PR, PS, PW, you need to know what it is and grab it in case you need it. Uh, and you need to know that these exist, these are very important. So if you average, now the bar on top of these uh, derivatives just means it's an average over an orbit. If you average those, uh, you, you find pretty interesting stuff. The uh, angular momentum is not, it can oscillate, of course it's, everything is going to oscillate. You will see in your plots if you try. These variables are oscillating, but they don't have a trend to increase or decrease, they just keep oscillating. So inclination goes up and down a little bit, eccentricity does as well, H as well.
but they don't have a tendency to increase or decrease due to J2. While these, uh, these do. And there is um, a lot there to say because, well, first of all, if I look at the big omega average, I can say that, uh, well, if, let's see, cosine of the inclination is greater than zero, which means that the inclination is what? It's uh, zero, um, should exclude 90 for now. Um, what happens to that expression? 90 is excluded, okay? I'll just treat that separately. What happens? I have a minus in front, I have a lot of stuff here, but 3 over 2 is a, it's a constant, it's a positive value, J2 is a constant, positive, 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 this is 1 minus E squared, squared, it's positive, this is of course positive. So this is dictating the sign with a minus. So an orbit that has an inclination between 0 and 90, if this is your this is your ECI basis. It means that the angle between the angular momentum and Z is at the most 90. So let's just do a generic one. Um, at the most, it becomes polar, right? You see that? Look at the plane of the orbit. The plane of the orbit is at 90 degrees with respect to H. So if I move H, the plane goes with it. They are attached, they go together, right? So at the most, if I go all the way down here to 90 degrees with Z, I get a polar orbit. It's, in the, it's containing the Z in its plane, right? But those are regular prograde orbits. They rotate like the planet, west to east, okay? If you go past 90 degrees, then you're gonna see a retrograde orbit. It goes against the planet, east to west, right? So, but in that case, prograde orbit creates what? What does this create? This gives me a negative uh, average omega dot. So forget about oscillations. This omega, the, the, what is omega by the way? It's this angle, right? This is the line of nodes. This is the line of nodes. So yeah, it may oscillate in time, but it does have a clear trend to decrease. Okay? So if you have an orbit at 90, uh, at, I'm sorry, at uh, an inclination between 0 and 90, this line, it will want to get closer to x, it will want to go that way. It's decreasing. The angle omega is decreasing. Clear? Just looking at the sign of omega dot. Omega dot bar. And then, uh, then what do we have? If instead is negative, which means I am between, again, I want to exclude 90. 90 and 180 degrees. Then, I'm going to go here. I have the opposite case, of course. Omega dot bar is positive. So if I have a retrograde orbit, uh, now the line of nodes is moving in such a way that it's increasing the omega. Yes. Average. So basically these are averaged Gauss variational equations with J2 where, as you can notice, you don't see the true anomaly anymore. The true anomaly is what really you can use to average the motion. Of, again, I'm not going into the details how, how this is done. You can read the details. It's really not a big deal. It's a lot of math, but you're averaging the previous equations over one orbit and that removes the theta removes the oscillations that you see in those equations. And uh, so that's what happens. Um, now, if uh, the case that I'm missing here, if cosine of the inclination is zero, which means the inclination is exactly 90 degrees, which means it's a polar orbit, then there is no drift, as we call it, of the line of nodes. It stays there. Okay? If you put it at 90 degrees, meaning this plane where the orbit is living contains the z-axis, that's a polar orbit, okay? The line of nodes is not moving. I mean, it oscillates back and forth, but these, again, these are average uh, equations. The center of that is remaining what it is. 
Is it clear? What I'm doing is I'm looking at this expression. I just just forget about what it's in this parenthesis. It's a, it's it's a positive quantity. There is a minus and a cosine of i. That's all I'm discussing here. How the ch the sign of that expression changes as I as I change the inclination. Um, now, just an intuitive point of view for this. I don't know how to draw an ellipsoid, to be honest. Uh, I can try. But uh, this is what we have modeled when we talk about J2. We have the Z2 axis, I'm sorry, the Z axis here, right? Which is the axis of symmetry of this ellipsoid. Any orbit that is not containing that axis has some non 90 degrees inclination. Uh, I can expect that the satellite is going from areas of, that is that is basically seeing different distribution of masses on one side or the other of the plane of the orbit, right? Basically, in other words, the plane of the orbit is not a symmetry plane. If I cut the planet through that, I don't see the same thing on one side or the other of this ellipsoid that I cut in half. If I, if I put the plane of the orbit containing the Z, which is the axis of symmetry of the ellipsoid, then it doesn't matter. I can cut that ellipsoid and I, say, I see the same geometrical shape on both sides. Does it make sense? If you cut a sphere at any axis in, you know, containing the center, you get two hemispheres. If I have an ellipsoid and you cut with a plane that contains the axis of symmetry, you get the same kind of shape, right? And so what that means is that as this satellite is flying on its orbit, at least this is the way I interpret the, the physics behind this, it's not really seeing a difference in terms of how the mass is distributed to the right or to the left. So the even though the planet is not a sphere, it is attracted by this side of the planet the same way it's attracted by the other side. The line of nodes has no reason to move around, to shift. While if the inclination is not 90, is not containing this axis of symmetry, then it's, 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 gonna, it's going to move. That is not a plane of symmetry. Does it make sense? You have different distribution of mass to the right or to the left. If I have more mass that way, I'm going to move that way, uh, and vice versa. That's the way I try to interpret the physics, and it makes sense. What is the use of this? Why is this so powerful other than you know, observing that this is moving? Is We have seen it, sun synchronous orbits. Now we can demonstrate how you build them. You choose that omega dot to be what you want, right? So if I want a sun synchronous orbit, as I said, it means uh, that, uh, let's see, that you set the omega dot average to be 360 degrees, which is, you know, one rotation of the Earth around the Sun, divided by 365.26 days. This is how long it takes. This is the actual duration of a year. And so, um, we did do this. It's an example in your book. 4.9. Now again, I have the third version of the book, so I don't know if it's exactly the same in yours, but I do have it. Uh, you do have this somewhere in one of the previous homeworks. I don't remember. I can just post the software again. So these are the data from uh, exercise um, 4.9, at least in my version. What they do here is they choose a semi-major axis. They choose a zero eccentricity, OK? Uh, they choose a semi-major axis of this value. And once you've chosen those, so that's, that's basically dictating your altitude, OK? You go in here to this formula. So I am giving you the eccentricity I want. I decide I want a circular orbit. I'm giving you the same major axis. J2 is a given constant. Mu is a given constant. This is the radius of the equator, at the equator. And, 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 I, and I'm setting the problem so that these are all given. I need to figure out what is the inclination that is going to give me a desired omega dot bar. That's all you do with that one equation. And you choose the right inclination to be sun synchronous at that particular eccentricity of the orbit at that particular semi major axis. So as you change the semi major axis, say that you just leave it circular. E is always zero. That's your desired sun synchronous orbit. And you keep uh, playing with the A, you're going to get slightly different inclinations that give you that uh, angular velocity, OK? Again, this is, point, this is the plane of the orbit, always looking at the sun. And I did run this in the past uh, with this data. Um, the 98.43 degrees, if you solve the math from that formula, is what you get. 
and the one plot that I showed you last time that we couldn't really justify why is this the way it looks now we can because I have selected the inclination to make it sun synchronous which means that the rate of the average ren is matching the rate of rotation of the planet uh, around the sun. By Earth's angular velocity here I mean uh, the Earth's angular velocity around the sun, not the spin uh, axis, okay? Not, not the spin velocity. So I could run it for longer, it would be clearer, but the, this is the angle of the Earth starting from zero um, around the sun, and that's the, uh, the Ren evolution, they have the same incline, the same slope, which is what I want. Make sense? Again, I don't know exactly, in this case it's starting from some number that I gave. I could change that initial big omega and I should still get the same... Uh, yeah, I think I can probably change this and get the same behavior. Because uh, that doesn't play into that equation. If it doesn't, I'll have to fix the code. Um, run. Have you guys ever seen a problem where... Um, some of the functions you develop in MATLAB disappear from your folder? I'm not kidding. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've lost, I, I was sure that, that I had some functions yesterday and I couldn't find them today. So I basically stole, it, stole them from my own website because at least they're posted there. I had two or three functions that just disappeared from my folder. You had that before? Grandma. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. Anyways, so I, yeah, I, the behavior is the same. I don't know why it's... Uh, what, what angle did I change? Starting from the same location? Um, oh, I changed the wrong one. That's why. Sorry. What is Ren? Here. This is just for fun. I don't know. 25. Any questions on this? So, so this is Gauss variational equations averaged with J2 only. And this is one of their uses. This is how people use them. They use them to create just, just uh, I'm sorry, sun synchronous orbits, for example. Uh, yep, yeah, see, it's, you know, same slope. That's what you want. Uh, the plane is rotating so that it's following the motion of the Earth around the sun. And that's one thing we wanted to discuss. There's more. There is the other equation that it's important here. Uh, you know, the theta, the theta is really not that, imp I mean, I don't usually look at the theta, because theta is the true anomaly. That is going to evolve anyways, it's going to go around uh, on your orbit. But the other orbital parameters are important. The little omega average, what happens? Uh, if you do the math, this is what happens. Okay. Uh, let's see what I have here. Uh, if uh, the inclination, so basically now instead of looking at just the cosine of i, I have a minus here, I have constants here, kind of constants, and here I have this expression that could be positive, negative, zero. So if you solve for that, you find out that if the inclination is between zero included and about 63.4 degrees, you get, uh, or, yeah, because that's a, there is a square there, or between 116.6 and 180 included. With this, you get a positive, I'm sorry, a neg yeah, positive, positive evolution of the argument of energy. That is where your eccentricity vector is pointing, okay? So this is an, a change in one of the orbital parameters in the plane. Otherwise, Of course, it's going to be negative, and at that, inclina at that inclination, uh, that those two that are excluded, so a 63.4, for example, or 116.6, it's zero. Again, you get an oscillation maybe, but the average is not going anywhere. Make sense? Just looking at equation 12.93c. Where is this used? Uh, the Molniya orbits, the alternative to geostationary satellites for the Russians, since they don't have access to easily put things into the equator without spending a lot of money or going to places to launch satellites where they're not allowed to go. Yeah, that's, that's what it is. Um, 
So what they do, they uh, choose usually that 63, 64, about 64 uh, degree inclination, create orbits that have very high eccentricity, <coughs> at that inclination so that this line, this is the line of ups, right? If your little omega is not changing, that line of ups remains more or less where it is. And so their goal is to shape these orbits in such a way that you don't spend too much time down here where you don't care about taking pictures of doing, making observations of the planet, but you slow down a lot in this area close to the apogee because that's the slowest part. And so you're spending a lot of time here looking down at some location on the Earth that it interests you. So the period, the entire period of these orbits is about 24 hours to match what a geostationary satellite would do, but you cannot spend the entire 24 hours on a specific location on the planet, but you can spend most of your orbit there. And in order to do so, you don't want to allow that argument of perigee to change. You don't want this line to continuously change in space, right? So that's the other use. Uh, so these equations are very powerful. All these kind of geometrical considerations, you will not be able to do it with ECI, XYZ, you know, approach. So that's why we have orbital elements. Uh, they're very, very useful. Uh, what do I want to tell you? This is Molnia. Uh, the drag, so this was J2, the drag that we have explored last time. I invite you to go back. Actually, for the drag, I don't even need to give you the average ones. I don't think the book has them. The drag is pretty straightforward. For example, the eccentricity, so this is not J2 anymore. This is only drag now, right? If I look at the Gauss variational equations for the eccentricity, we had something like this, minus rho b v e plus cosine of theta. What do you expect the average of these on an orbit to be? This piece is going from, you know, between minus 1 and 1. It's always oscillating. So if you average, probably this part will go away. This is what you're left with in terms of the drift. So this thing clearly drives, the drag drives the uh, eccentricity down. The d dt is negative. Make sense? So look at the other ones that I gave you, the dA dt, uh, the d little omega dt, the other ones are zero. Uh, and, 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 and realize what their averages are, they're pretty straightforward. The dA dt also, you will see a piece that has a sine of theta. When you average that, that, that disappears, and the remaining part is a negative uh, contribution. So also the same major axis is going down. Yes? So I have a question about what you do here with the I and the two separate arrows. Uh, what does this mean here? This one? Yes. At uh, this inclination or this inclination, that 5 over 2 sine squared of I minus 2, that is, becomes 0. So these two, these two angles? Uh, are the solution for the equation 5 over 2 sine squared of i, what is it, minus 2? Yeah, if you want to set this equal to 0, you get these two numbers. And what would that do that would make our... The, that equation goes to 0. Well, I mean, what would be the purpose of, what is the practical application of that equation going to do? I think I missed that. Oh, it's, it's for example, I don't know of other applications, there's probably more than this, but the Russians, when they, when they create these high eccentricity orbits that spend a lot of time uh, at the apogee looking down at a specific location on the planet, they don't want their line of, their line of ups to move. Uh, because remember, this, if this is your uh, node's line, uh, the little omega is the angle between the line of ups and the line of nodes, right? So you don't want that to change too much, because otherwise you keep trusting to go back to uh, an apogee that is going to look at what you want. Uh, if that drifts away, you will have to correct continuously. While in this case, you're using nature to just keep it there for Molnia orbits. By the way, Molnia is spelled out, how is it spelled out? I think I wrote it once. Molnia. I always get these two letters the wrong way. This means lightning in Russia. In Russian. But anyways. Um, so yeah, if you don't do this, you will have to trust all the time. Same, if you want an orbit that looks at the sun all the time, how about I, I use nature, I put it at the right inclination, it will do it by its own without me forcing the satellite to be always in sunlight. That's pretty powerful.
Okay. Um, I'll show you now something I played with yesterday, unless MATLAB has eaten all my functions again. So there was a question, how do I convert orbital parameters into, uh, I'm sorry, the gas variational equations, how do I integrate them? So I think I'm going to give you this homework, uncollected, where you do exactly what we've done so far for that problem with the ISS, okay? The ISS has these initial orbital parameters, the, the same ones that we've been using for a while. You convert those into Cartesian coordinates, you take that R and V and you integrate uh, the Cartesian equations with the ODE 45, nothing new, I mean at this point this is boring really. Uh, and then, um, but then you also integrate the, uh, the Gauss variational equations. Okay? Mm, what am I doing here? Oh no. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, the initial, oh, yeah, this, this is, so this is the part we have to focus on. Uh, and then you compare the two. You should get the same, so if you plot the orbital parameters that you get after you integrate, remember this, this is a solution for homework 2, it's posted already. So I integrate my equations of motion with J2, of course. I'm talking about J2 here. Uh, but really, it applies to J2 or drag, J2 and drag. So... You're integrating your equations of motion, you get R and V at any single time, you convert into the, uh, these guys, okay? And what you have done for homework two, you created plots for this. Just look at them, how they evolve. Well, another way to get them is not doing this, you don't integrate the ECI equations of motion, you just directly integrate the Gauss variational equations, right? They give you in time A, E, I, a big omega, little omega, and theta, uh, and they should look the same. If they don't, there is an error somewhere, right? Uh, the, the, the end goal is the oscillating orbital parameter. So if I run this, that's exactly what it's doing. Uh, it's taking that initial ISS orbital parameters. Whoa. Okay, so this is the true anomaly. This is the only one that is going to look different because uh, my true anomaly in the conversion, so the blue, uh, plot is, uh, I take x, y, z, x dot, y dot, z dot, and at each time I convert into orbital parameters, and since I decided those angles have to be between 0 and pi in this case, yeah, so this is going to jump every 360, so that's why the blue line looks like that, while if you integrate the Gauss variational equation, those equations don't have any filter built into them that tell, you, that tell an angle to stop at 360, they just keep going, okay, so that's why these two plots match exactly up to 360 and that, that keeps going while the other one is wrapping again and it starts from zero and, and it keeps going, but that's okay. For the other ones, we don't have this problem because they don't go, they don't, in this simulation, they don't exceed the range. So, where is the blue one? Uh, <clears throat> Select the red one, Control X, gone, it was right below. That's how I check if my results are the same. If you can create a plot and you can see the plots are the same, just put them on top of each other. I do it. That's one way. Or you can subtract the, the two vectors that you get uh, from different solutions and, and compute the norm of the vector difference. You can do that as well. But anyways, so this is the argument of perigee. In blue, it's the one I obtain, again, from x, y, z, x dot, y dot, z dot, converting to orbital elements at each time step. That's what I get. Uh, but the red one that I just removed and I'm going to put back there is what I get from gas variational equations and so on and so forth. So these are also, this is the blue is below, everything is matching. Now how am I doing that? How am I integrating the gas variational equations, which is here? So you do have, in this particular problem, you do have initial A, initial E, initial I, right? Those were given. So you basically have to create a uh, function that creates the differential equations uh, the Gauss variational equations, uh, and then integrate with um, ODE45. So let's look at that function that I have. Okay, you come in here. Um, as exactly, I mean, the structure is the same that you've, you, you've used for Cartesian in, uh, equations uh, integration. You have a function where the first input is always time, the second one is, is the variables you're trying to integrate. In this, before it was x, y, x, uh, z, x dot, y dot, z dot, in this case is the orbital elements. So that orb L vector is the six orbital elements at any given time. And then unfortunately what happens is uh, that you do need to do a lot of work here. 
you do need to convert into R and V, there's probably an easier way than this, but I already had this done somewhere else. So I just copied and pasted it. You can probably do it in an easier way. But bottom line is that I do compute also velocity and, uh, and R. Why? Because they do, uh, they do come into place when, when, when you have to integrate the gas variational equation. So this is the structure. You have orbital parameters coming in, converting to R and V. Uh, this is the PR, S, and W, just taken from the book, the ones that I just showed you. Perturbation due to J2 in the three directions. And these are the gas variational equations, the general form, um, where, of course, PR, PS, and PW have been assigned before. And uh, this is showing you why I went through the pain of computing the angular momentum, uh, radius, and velocity up there, because I need, I need the angular momentum norm, I need the uh, position vector norm, so there's other stuff that appears in these equations that you have to compute if you want to integrate them, okay? But probably my conversion into the full V and R up there, it's probably an overkill. You can probably get, all you need is really H norm and R norm. So you can probably get them without doing all the things that I've done up there, but that's, that, that still works. And so at the end, what this is creating is time derivative of A, time derivative of E, of the inclination of ren of little omega of true anomaly, and that becomes the output of the function, the same way you've done for uh, this equation. When you have done this, what have you really done? You said that this is equivalent on the x direction to this, and similar equations on the y and on the z, right? That's what you have in your code. And so just think it the same way. The x is coming in as an input to the function, uh, the y and the z as well, and I assemble the right-hand side of the derivative, the same thing I'm doing here. Um, the variables that come in assemble the right-hand side of this, and the output is the time derivatives. And you give it to the ODE45. And in this case, it's even easier because these are all first order differential equations. Here we have to do a change of variable or something like that. It's a second order differential equation. But in this case, they're all first order. So, so how about I post this main function? Everything is done. You really have to do only one thing. You need to create this GVE uh, function here that creates the differential equations in A, E, I, etc. Again, it can remain uncollected, it's really something you should do. Uh, but this, this should clear all of the doubts about how do I integrate them. Because in general, you may have perturbations where you, can, you don't have the luxury of you know, having J2 that you can express nicely uh, with some math and then average and look at the general effects. In some cases, you don't have that, so you just have to integrate the equations directly. Okay? Any questions, concerns, issues? going to be shorter today, probably. You have any other questions about anything else? No? Yes? Are you leaving the exam grade that is? <laughs> <laughs> Depends. You guys are still going to talk to these guys, right? To the TAs first. And then if that doesn't go anywhere, you come talk to me and we'll see. But I want to, I want to give you time to discuss the grades with the TAs and me, and then we'll see what the average is. I can tell you I've looked not only at the average, I looked at the number of people who are above uh, 80, which is a B, right? It's, uh, it's less. So I don't like what I see right now, so probably something will change. Um, but uh, what I am observing is that those who are doing very well are still doing very well in, in general. Uh, some people may have dropped the ball about doing the homework, I think. Uh, or, or you know, maybe they didn't have too much time to do it carefully. I don't know what it is, but um, the one thing that I can tell you is, for some, for many of you, this, the, you know, the tests again, I don't think they're hard. The homework, I can agree, it is pretty involving. But uh, at the end, if I leave you with some tools that you can use out of here, then I have done my job. If I just make it extremely easy, and you can't go to an employer and say hey, I got SDK certified while I was doing Astro, and I can also do a ground track, and I can tell you when you can see the satellite from your house. I think that is a good thing to have on your CV and, and to be able to talk about. So the fact that you're struggling now, it's probably okay. 
Uh, you may not get the grade you want. Um, we'll try to be fair, as fair as possible. I, I think I tried, uh, but again, um, I want to keep the homework so involved in because this is the real astrodynamics that you're going to do if you do research or if you work in this field. No one is going to do Keplerian orbits. No one cares about that stuff. No one is going to tell you, oh, let's assume there's no perturbations. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> so, uh, I do understand that many don't have to, because now I think they introduced MATLAB as a requirement for the new students. Probably you guys were not forced to learn MATLAB the same way that now they do. Um, so I do understand there is some, some hard time with the homeworks probably, but believe me, this is, this is, this is good stuff. This is real stuff. Uh, just, just to give you an idea of, of the real stuff that we're talking about. Um, oh yeah, I have a nice video that I want to show you. We still have 10 minutes. So uh, Friday, by the way, we're going to talk about solar radiation pressure and, uh, and how we've used it uh, in one of the research activities we have to, I think we talked about this briefly, to take a satellite from the geo belt, uh, use a solar sail, move it up to the graveyard orbit, take it out of the way, come down with the solar sail, grab another one. So that, that will be explained. Um, and S SRP is another perturbation of interest. Once you leave low Earth orbit, there is no more drag. The effect of J2 fades away. Look at those expressions with J2. They're all divided by R to the fourth. So as you go higher and higher, the fact that the planet is not a sphere anymore uh, matters less and less, because you don't see those differences in shapes. Um, so DARPA is looking at taking a satellite and uh, going and service geostationary satellites. Um, so the one thing that we'll do next week that I really care about and I want to do is relative motion of satellites, how we model now two objects that are flying relatively close to each other because there are ways to simplify the equations of motion and even get linear equations of motion that tell you how spacecraft A and B are moving with respect to each other. So we are talking about doing this. Um, so we, we are studying stuff that it's absolutely applicable. Uh, one thing that you guys missed yesterday, we had uh, some folks for Kennedy that gave a talk at the Small Satellite Design Club. Uh, they talked about the New Star mission, which is functioning right now. It's in Leo. It's been up there for a while. It's coming down very slowly. Uh, and it was amazing how they put it into orbit. Uh, they have a Pegasus rocket under an airplane. At the top of the rocket, there is uh, the spacecraft. So the airplane gets to uh, close to the equator. Then the rocket detaches and it starts flying actually horizontal until it, it brings the satellite to, um, to Leo, more or less at the equatorial plane. Um, so there is a lot of stuff that I think at this point you may not realize immediately, but you're going to be very well educated to discuss. You know the dynamics behind what you see. Um, so I think, I think that's, that's, that's all you need from um, a class that only lasts a semester, to be honest. Uh, but that was pretty amazing. So those guys, why do they do that? Because if you want to put something at the equatorial plane, you want to launch a satellite as close as possible to a location which is on the equator, right? And so they ended up going to, I don't know what island, in the middle of nowhere, past the Hawaii, towards Japan, which is close to the equator, but it's not close enough. So they put this thing on a plane so that they can fly in the middle of the Pacific and get close to the equator and then detach the rocket that goes up. I mean, NASA and, you know, people, are, 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 they're doing crazy stuff. Things that are very creative and unbelievable. I, they told us that the guy who's flying, uh, you can look it up probably, New Star is the name of the mission, N-U Star. The guy who's flying that plane is one of the few who can do that kind of stuff, meaning fly an airplane with a rocket under the belly of the airplane. They told me he's 90 years old. <laughs> he's, but he's, he's probably one of the few who can do that, so they keep using the same guy. <laughs> yeah. So, huh? Is he going to train anyone new? Or? I hope so. Well, it's not like they launch, I don't think they launch these things, you know, on a regular basis. This was a very specific, the new star mission is, uh, it's been able to, you probably read it in the news, uh, they've been able to prove the existence of gravitational waves because it's looking at black holes and they detected the merging of two black holes and the emission of gravitational waves. So it's a pretty complex spacecraft, but uh, it's not something that they probably you know, launch all the time. But the, 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 the amount of work, you know, they, they start from Kennedy, they go to Vanderberg, they put 
the spacecraft inside the fairing of the rocket, then they fly with that, uh, and it's continuously, by the way, air conditioned. The inside of the rocket is continuously air conditioned, even after under the belly of the space of the uh, sorry of the aircraft. They go to Hawaii. From Hawaii, they go to this atoll, the small island in the middle of nowhere. It takes forever just to launch one spacecraft. They do amazing stuff, and you guys may be involved in all this stuff. And I want you to be ready to talk their language when you you know when you look at these missions. That's that's really the goal. Uh, one thing. So some some of you have asked, have asked me. This is probably a good time. Uh, about next semester and the capstone class. How many have to take aerospace design one? So I'll teach that class, um, as I probably told you. Uh, I know you're crying already. Um, yes. But uh, SDK is, of course, again, part of that. Uh, is not everybody is going to work in SDK. The idea for the class will be um, having a customer from outside, probably the same folks I'm working with at Kennedy. Someone giving us some, just a one page of requirements to design some kind of spacecraft. Probably a small spacecraft, I don't know. But I don't want to be the one dictating the project. I want the customer from outside giving us something to do. You guys assemble in teams no more than 10 people, uh, and, uh, and we work on that. There will be a couple of presentations that we give to them. Last time I've done this, it was with a customer from Johnson Space Center. It was a CubeSat with electric propulsion, rendezvousing with asteroids, and possibly landing. The students have done crazy stuff with SDK and Astrogator. I couldn't believe it. They've done an amazing job. Uh, we published two conference papers out of that class. So if, you know, if you're taking the next step of this, uh, you're going to use everything that we have done, especially SDK, which I haven't touched too much, but you guys can get certified by yourself. Um, and again, I haven't heard any concerns about that. It's probably pretty straightforward, but um, I have two people now with a master's level. Yeah, going up. There is a month left, not even. 20 days. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? I'll see you on Friday. Yes.